Chasing Giants with Don Higgins and Terry Peer. Brought to you by Osseo Camo, nature's most lethal camouflage. Follow along as Don and Terry discuss the techniques, strategies, and dedication needed to harvest one of God's most amazing creations, world-class whitetails. Well, welcome everyone to the Chasing Giants podcast, episode 223, airing on May 26th. Your host, Don Higgins, and I'm Terry Peer. Thanks for joining us. On we got a couple of really interesting topics that we want to talk about today. We got a new sponsor that we want to just let everybody know who he is. He's going to be on the show, and everybody's going to be seeing a lot more of him with some other business ventures that we have coming soon. But the the main topic that uh, is probably the biggest news for both of us is we are done with spring food plot planning. Yeah, I wrapped up this week and uh, just in time we got a couple nice showers. Uh, one was only a couple tents, then we had one that was six tents and got more rain uh, forecast for tomorrow. So my plots are all up except for my soybeans and, and I expect them to be up any day because I planted them six days ago. And they've got the moisture. They may be up. I just didn't check them today. So uh, things are looking good at this point. Yeah, we're recording on Saturday late afternoon, early evening. This will air Sunday. We have big storms and rain scheduled for all day tomorrow, or most of the day tomorrow. So I'm I'm venturing to guess that my beans are up also. Let's let's walk through real quick before we move on in the podcast. How many acres of what did you plant? And I'll go through kind of the uh, the acreages that you did. Wow, you put me on the spot. I have to think about this. So I did one plot of Nutricrave corn. It's about a three acre plot. I did three plots of soil charge that will go into a deadly dozen this fall, and those three plots probably total about uh, four acres. And then I did, on my farm, I did uh, three three soybean plots, and, and those three soybean plots will total probably four acres. And I did, uh, on, on the second farm, you know, that we always toured with the master class, I put that plot in soybeans. So anybody listening that's been in the master class, they'll remember that second property where we walked behind the grain bins, and that's where the plot was. That pot is in soybeans this year, and it's that's maybe in... you've been soybeans on top of soybeans about every year. You you go back to back on that farm. At last year it was in deadly dozen, um, mm-hmm. so I, I no tilled right into the deadly dozen that I sprayed. But uh, yeah, I'll typically do about two years of soybeans and then break it up with deadly dozen one year. Right. So I put in. I didn't do quite as much food this year. I did about seven acres. But Brandon Epperson, our friend that we we talked about him a couple of weeks ago on the podcast that shot that you know two hundred plus inch deer, mm-hmm. he came over with his no till drill. For all of the guys who have always sent comments to me about no tilling, yes, half of my plots were actually no till, but we did till half of it. So same inputs, same same soil, same seed. Half of three different plots are no-till back into corn or bean stubble and then half of them have been worked so i'm really interested to see if there's any difference in my soil with as much clay as i have with compaction and whether i'm going to go full no-till next year or not should be a very interesting story to kind of document through the summer and late winter yeah i'm shifting to no-till i think i might even for the last few years the only thing i've tilled has been my corn plots but i'm thinking about trying to no-till those corn pots next year i got a couple of friends uh mike mitchell the mm-hmm. apple man from uh, mike's mighty micros yeah that we we did the video on um his orchard and and his farm is totally you know it's not organic i don't know what you'd call it, regenerative ag Regen- and, yeah. and then i've got a friend uh out in iowa jack who uh, his entire farm is into this well he's been using biologicals on his soil for i think the last three years yeah, and uh, those two guys have been pretty instrumental in getting open in my mind to different ideas yep. about my plots. And yeah, you know, one thing about Mike is he backs it up with with food that you can taste. So uh, Jack was actually at my place this week, and we went and visited Mike at the orchard because I knew them two guys would have a lot to talk about. And right. so Mike, 
he gave us a couple of things that that were grown there at his orchard. One was an apple, best apple I ever had in my life. (laughs) Juicy, sweet apple that was grown using these regenerative ag practices. And then this strawberry slush stuff that he makes with the straw, they grow strawberries under their fruit trees that both were just absolutely fantastic. Anybody in the Sullivan area, uh, Sullivan, Illinois area, ought to go to Oak Hall Valley Orchard and, and check those guys out. And also, you can buy Mike's Mighty Micros while you're there. But uh, I've got some experimenting I'm doing on some plots this year with some new products, not not real world products, just things that these guys have turned me on to. And uh, I'm going to be doing some tissue analysis comparison on treated versus untreated. And yep. um, as I learn, I don't like throwing mm-hmm. ideas out until I, I've I've seen the results. I don't want to mislead anybody, but. Uh, We'll see what happens. There's probably going to be some fodder for some good videos through all this. Yeah, I think I think both of us are going to have some pretty good documentation and tests. The other thing that I worked on is, you know, everybody thinks that soybeans, we've done it for so long and it's our flagship that we're still never testing anything. There is actually two additional varieties of soybeans and one variety of corn on my property this year to do direct side-by-side comparisons. So uh, I really want to provide not only feedback back for people like Dwayne who can look at that tissue analysis and dive into so much more detail than even we understand, but also some guidance for other hunters that go to the local co-op and say, just give me their best Roundup Ready bean that you have and be able to show and document that. So we got a lot of content that I think we're going to be able to get from both of our farms this year. Um, I mentioned that to Steve Shields this week that we got some projects with that that hopefully we'll be able to follow through the summer. I'm excited about it. Yeah, and I think I mentioned maybe last week or the week before that my three soil charge plots are all different. So the one mm-hmm. plot is is in the blend that we're currently selling, and then the other two I use that blend we're currently selling as a base, but I added some different uh, plant species to the mix. Yep. And uh, we'll be video documenting all that and seeing how those work out. But uh, I think this regenerative ag thing is is the real deal. Yep. Like I said, the Mike has convinced me with the food that he's producing on his. You can taste the difference. Uh, yep. You can see the difference in the growth of his fruit trees and his strawberry plants. His strawberry plants have leaves about the size of your hand on, and uh, you can taste it in the berries they produce. So. You know, if we can taste it, surely the deer can. And my thinking is that if my plots taste better than anything around, guess where the deer's going to be in my plots? And if I got to expand my acreage to take care of them, I'll, I'll do so. So if we plant strawberries, are you going to drive down and do all the taste testing on mine since I refuse to actually ever try a strawberry? Well, you can send me some and I'll test them, but I probably won't drive <laughs> car to Kentucky for a strawberry. <laughs> All right. Well, that's a good update. Also, I got a favor to ask of everybody. Those of you who bought the sorghum test pilot plot from us, make sure you guys are taking pictures of that and tagging real world wildlife products on social media so we can keep up with that. We'll be checking in with a lot of people around to get samples sent in and uh, so we can see how that pilot program. For those of you who don't know, Don and I do these experiments on our properties and people that we we know that get kept really quiet and we piddle around with this stuff for years and then when it's finally ready to go out we put it in a pilot program out to unavailable in a limited quantity so we got some of that out there this year and we're excited to hear the feedback from everybody else we got a great topic to come back to after the break from Asia, and that is why there are so many young bucks killed on the side of the road So I really um, want to talk to Don, especially about this. We've both noticed it, but stay tuned after the break from Osseo, and we're going to get back to that topic. Osseo Gear has perfected one of the most innovative camo patterns on the market. The unique camo pattern designed to mimic the feather patterns of one of North America's greatest predators, the great horned owl. Combined with intuitive features, superior comfort, and ultra high quality fabrics give bow hunters the ultimate advantage. ICO has outfitted over 10,000 bow hunters across the country with over a thousand five-star reviews. Visit ASIOgear.com to check it out for yourself. Use code CHASINGGIANTS for 15% off. 
Well, okay, Don, thanks to the friends at Osseo. I believe Joe Miles is on another trip, maybe out for a red stag somewhere. Who knows? But uh, best of luck to him and his travels. Look like he had a good trip to Africa. But let's dive into this. It's not quite a velvet season where we're out driving and looking at alfalfa or soybean fields, you know, around these big sections out in the Midwest looking for uh, bachelor groups. But as we've been driving, you said it before we got on the podcast, and I've noticed it also. There's a lot of roadkill bu- uh, yearling bucks killed right now, and uh, people probably don't even pay too much attention to it. But I think if you understand the yearly cycle of what's going on with whitetail, it might start clicking a little bit for you. Don, talk a little bit about what you've seen along the road here in the last couple of weeks and even what you saw today. Yeah, well, today you know, I sold some cattle to some folks in Ohio, and, and today I hauled those cattle uh, and met the folks uh, right on the Indiana-Ohio line, Richmond, Indiana, which is right on Interstate 70, right on the Indiana-Ohio line. So I had about a three-and-a-half, four-hour drive from my house each way, um, and I seen a bunch of deer hit on the interstate. You'd almost think it was the rut. That's how many deer was hit, and what I've done, and I've seen, and it wasn't, it wasn't just, today. just today, I've been seeing them for the last couple of weeks. And the, the thing I've noticed is that these deer I've seen in the past couple of weeks that were hit on the road, probably 80 plus percent of them are yearling bucks. And I, I notice it every year. And this isn't the first spring that I've noticed it. But here's what's happening is, you know, the does are having fawns right now. We're just getting into the fawning season. Now, there's been a few that were born, you know, before now in, in recent weeks, but we're really getting into the heart of the fawning season. And, you know, those those does are going to drive away last year's buck fawns. And it doesn't, they don't, the doe doesn't wait till right when she's going to have her fawns. I mean, she starts, you know, I, I don't know, it varies, I'm sure, but a month, a couple of weeks before she's going to fawn, she kicks off last year's buck fawns and chases them away. And at the same time, you know, Mother Nature is, ingrained into these deer's mind that they need to relocate and find their own home so so these deer that are being hit on the road are these young bucks that were have just dispersed from their birthplace in recent weeks and now they're wandering about the countryside this is when you'll see deer in town where you typically never see them you'll hear about them in a walmart parking lot or (laughs) crashing through a glass window into some store or something most of the time it's a yearling buck he's on that dispersal journey has no idea where he's going, has no idea where he's going to end up. And it really happens. I mean, it's, it's really just started now, but it'll yep. continue to some degree, you know, into the fall, even on, on my that, place. That, I will, that yearling bucks basically trying to find a bachelor group to hook up with is what's going on. That, that's what happen, happens now. But when that bachelor group breaks up, you know, he'll disperse again sometime. He may stay there, but. You know, on my place, I've noticed a lot of times that the, the yearling bucks that are on my place in early October are, are gone by the 1st of December. Once the rut kicks in, those bucks go wandering again. And the bucks that I have here in the late season, they aren't the same bucks that were here early. That that, that dispersal just continues for, for several months. But right now, it's started and started in earnest, and these deer are just wandering around. They don't know where they're going. or where they're going to end up, and they, they walk across the interstates, and they get hit. And uh, If you guys are seeing a, a lot of deer hit on the road, take notice, because a lot of them are, are yearling bucks. And another thing I'll throw out that I've noticed from these yearling bucks is, man, they've got some good antler growth this year compared to normal. I mean, some of these, these yearlings, they're obviously yearlings because they got antlers that are about as big around as your thumb in velvet. But uh, there's some of them that will have 8 or 10 inches of growth already, and we're not even into June. So it just kind of verifies that we're having a fantastic antler growing season this year, and I hope it continues. It looks like the forecast, we've got rain scheduled tomorrow, and then there's there's more about a week from now. If we can get timely rains throughout the summer, this is going to be fantastic, and that's going to lead into another topic for next week. Yep. Well, the term that people have heard us use on this podcast and in our seminars and master classes is called maternal aggression. And that's just the physiological nature, God's creation. We we talk about how complex God's creation really is, but this is really that mother pushing that yearling buck off to prevent inbreeding 
to her, the likelihood of a buck fawn at some point breeding a full-blooded sister is almost impossible um, because, of, you know, just that's a whole different topic that we can go into. But breeding a full-blooded sister is almost impossible. But breeding the, the mother would be, uh, you know, um, that's just God's way. We, we, we talk about um, yearling mountain lions or cougars, you know, showing up at weird places. This is the exact same thing. But that's why we're getting so much of that. But Don, you just said something a minute ago that really intrigued me. And that is, we talk about bucks showing up in the late season for some odd reason, where they came from, where they knew, or how they knew that was there. Having food right now on your property and having no intrusion on your property, you have, say, these this, these groups of year and a half old yearlings coming through, knowing that there's plentiful food, habitat, safety, no intrusion. That could be a buck that maybe wasn't born on your property, but that would remember that from when times get really tough three, four, five years from now that need to go back to find safety somewhere. That could be also a way that a buck shows up later on. So having food and having no intrusion or pressure on your property as these bucks are moving back and forth trying to find their way is, is really vital. And we can tie this right back into the previous conversation we had before the Osseo break. You know, if you've got a, your food sources on your property are, are the best that that deer has ever encountered, the most nutrient dense, the sweetest, whatever, he's going to remember it. And, you know, you can take this land management thing to a whole new level that, that most folks don't even think about. And you make an impact on a young buck that's, passing through or maybe he was there for a few couple months in the summer with the bachelor group the bachelor group breaks up he takes off well he he remembers where he's been i mean there, <laughs> there's it, it's not a far stretch to think that he couldn't come back at some point in the future and i'll say that in the winter time when the the new bucks show up at my place you know it happens just about every year that i will have a buck show up an older buck i'm not talking a year and a half old i'm mm. talking like a four and older and, and i have not got that buck's picture anywhere and you know i've got cameras for miles around my farm so i've got a pretty good handle on bucks and not only my on my property but in the whole neighborhood for you know two or three or four miles around and, and yet i never have a picture of these bucks and boom here they are they show up where they came from i have no idea but, you know, research has shown that these bucks in ag country, like I'm in anyway, and probably very similar where you're at, research has shown that these bucks on average are going to disperse 5 to 20 miles from where they're born. But there's been a lot of them that went a lot farther than that. There's been several radio yep. collared yearlings that went over 100 miles. Right. So, yeah, I mean, all of these myths out there that you don't want to have food, you don't want to, you know, have this on your property around me. Every day that you can impact and, and train or teach or identify your property as the best food, the best habitat, and the safest place, you got a better chance of pulling that back at some point. Um, just think about that. It's the People try to overcomplicate, and I only have food here or this time of the year. It, it, have it as much as you can. Have your, have your farm secure of intrusion and safety. Um, yeah, you don't want your farm to be known to that one yearling buck as the one that you bumped him and right. ran him off, right? He's he's not going to come back if he remembers that. Well, I say to my consulting clients all the time in my conversations with them that, you know, I got a little slide presentation that I do before at the start of the day. I just started that this year, by the way. So if you had me out there previously and didn't see it, you, you know what I'm I'm talking about. I just started it this year. But one of the slides says... It's got a picture of a, a hunting magazine cover, and it's got a picture of a computer screen on the slide, and it says, forget everything you read or saw, <laughs> <laughs> because there's a lot of, of bad information out there. Now, there's some there's some great information out there, too. I mean, we're not the only ones putting out good information. There is a lot of good information, but the thing that, that a, a lot of uh, beginning deer hunters or novice deer hunters have trouble with is deciphering the good from the bad. They read something. Right. They don't know. Is this good information? Is bad information? And, and so I tell them to, to just forget it and follow the plan for, you know, give it at least three years and, and then, you know, see what happens. Right. But uh, I, I think one of the, the worst pieces of advice that I've ever seen on the internet is that 
the idea that you do not provide food on your farm at certain times of the year. I want food there every single day, 365 days a year. I want the very best that I can have 365 days a year. The whole idea of not providing food at certain times of the year is absolutely plum ridiculous. And uh, I, I think it's more clickbait to, to get views on a video than anything. But that is, that's probably one of the worst pieces of advice I've ever seen on the Internet. Yep. All right. Well, that's that's just fascinating. I hope people comment down below if you've seen a bunch of bu or, uh, yearling bucks or deer hit along the side of the road that seems abnormally high for uh, summer. Let us know what you've seen out there. We like to see those comments below. Let's take a, a pivot right here. And herbicide questions are almost a full time job for us this time of year. And I answered at least three or four of the same one today. And one of those is, and maybe we can just answer a couple of them periodically the next couple of weeks, because a couple of weeks ago, we went through every herbicide that we know. Um, we need to just start emailing back the link of the podcast every time somebody asks us this. But let's let's take the next couple of weeks and just answer a, a one segment of it. And that is how quick or how soon do I spray my soybean plot? Say they're a Gen 2 Roundup Ready soybean. And we got beans starting to emerge the next couple of weeks, but there's also everything else that comes up with it. How soon do you spray your soybeans, Don? You want to spray those soybeans before those weeds get four inches tall. I mean, a, a little one or two inch weed is ideal. Spray it. And what will happen is once those soybeans canopy and shade the ground, the new weed growth stops. I mean, you're not going to get new weeds. Now, the weeds that are already there and the sprouted, they're going to continue to grow, obviously. But if you can go in there when those soybeans are, you know, three or four inches tall and the weeds are three or four inches tall and kill all the weeds, well, it's going to not only kill the weeds, it's going to cut down the competition for those soybean plants and they're going to explode in growth and they're going to soon uh, shade the ground. That's why I like uh, drilled soybeans better than, than 30 inch rows or even 15 inch rows. I think the seven and a half inch rows with the G series drill is absolutely perfect. And yep. it doesn't matter if you're planting 60 pounds per acre of soybeans. It doesn't matter if those 60 pounds are in 30 inch rows, 15 inch rows, right. or seven and a half inch rows. It's right. still 60 pounds an acre. In, in fact, having them scattered out in narrower rows, but a little bit farther space between each seed will shade the ground a whole lot quicker and, and canopy over and will help you with your weed competition. But don't let those weeds get very tall. Try to get them before they're four inches tall. And if we have to run over our soybeans, say we're spraying with an ATV sprayer, we're spraying with a tractor, you know, if you're if you're running over your soybean plants before they're eight, ten inches tall, you're not snapping them. They're they're just going to, they'll bounce back or fill in if we do damage the plant. So don't worry about that too much. And, you know, using a G-Series drill or even broadcasting beans, that canopy just covers so much quicker. So, you know, if you're on 30 inch rows and you spray, you know, when that weed's there, you just need to be prepared. You might have to spray a second time just because that takes longer for that canopy. Again, that goes back to what we've been talking about, a better residual at the beginning is going to make such a big difference later on. So mm -hmm. I know it's a little bit overwhelming and kind of intimidating to the average food plotter, but, you know, studying up on your chemicals is an important part. Right. And yeah. residual herbicides are huge. I mean, if you haven't planted yet corn or soybeans, put a residual or a pre-emergent herbicide. That'll prevent a lot of those weeds. Yep. And then the the the... Kind of similar question to that is ratios. People follow the label. It just peel that label back and read it. We're not going to tell you. I can tell you for glyphosate, Roundup, as long as it's a Roundup only, you can pour that 41% glyphosate on a plant directly and it's okay. But there's mm -hmm. other herbicides you have to watch what you mix. We're not going to give you that as, as much as we want to help people. We are not going to take that responsibility mm. for read the label. That's all I'm going to say, right? Exactly. And, you know, we're going to tell you what to spray on your crop, whether, you know, whether you're trying to kill grass in your clover or, you know, weeds in your soybeans. We're going to tell you what to spray, but we're not going to give you the rates. And I, I get so many questions about rates and, and guys don't understand rates that they'll, 
And I think that's why we get a lot of the questions. They'll say, how many ounces glyphosate do I use per gallon of water? Well, that's that's not the way it works. It's yeah. how much of this chemical do you use per acre? Yep. And how much water is, is irrelevant in, in most cases? Now, there's some chemicals that you need to use more or less water. But, yep. you know, with glyphosate, for example, you could if it takes a quart per acre, you could mix that quart with 10 gallons of water. You could mix it with 30 gallons of water. It doesn't matter as long as you cover an acre with whatever you mix it with. Yep. So, again, every chemical is different the instructions please let's uh let's go ahead and let's answer probably two questions and then we're going to talk about our good friend and new sponsor of the podcast but let's let's answer a couple questions first and get those decked out okay all right i'll say that uh, while i'm waiting on this first question to pop up i dug back in the archives for some of these and uh uh there's people that haven't received their t-shirts yet i'm out of several sizes of t-shirts i'm waiting on new t-shirts so uh, if you haven't received a T-shirt yet, does, that doesn't mean you're not getting one. It just means that we're probably out of your size. But if you did not put your address on the submission, you're not going to get one. You're going to have to submit another question and get it selected. But We've uh, wow. we've known about this new sponsor for a little bit, and we had our most recent shirts made with that logo on the back. So that they should be done here in the next week or two. Yep. Uh, right. The first one comes from Jerry Sinclair from Des Moines, Iowa. It says, Don and Terry, love the podcast and how you guys use your platform. My question is for both of you. We often hear you talk about all the great people you <laughs> meet and neat places you see while consulting. It all sounds so positive, but I know there has to be some negative as well. Can you share some of the not-so-fun things you have seen and people you have met in your travels? I bet you have some interesting stories. <laughs> but, Jerry, you have an interesting question. <laughs> You know, I, I can honestly say that, you know, I, I don't know how many properties I've done now, several hundred. I, I don't have any client that, that I thought was ever a jerk to me at, at all. Now, there's been some that some misunderstandings that had to be cleared up in that. But I, I think everyone, every single client I've ever had has been a very understanding person uh, with reasonable expectations. I, I think some of them were expecting something different than I got. But once I explained, you know, I, I don't have a problem with any of my clients. They, they've all been great. So there's not anything negative to me. To me, the biggest negative is sleeping in a motel every night when I'm on the road. And that's having it. The, having the cops wake you up and you come to the door with your tidy whities on? Yeah, that has happened. And I hope it don't ever happen again. Having your truck broken into... I hope that never happens again. I stayed in the wrong neighborhood that night. I, I didn't know it at the time, but I found out later. But, you, you know, it really is pretty much po a positive. You know, you meet great people. They treat me fantastic. I get to see different properties. The, the thing I will say, though, is that when I go on to a property today, I feel two things, two points I want to make here. When I go on to a property today, I feel that most of the time, I know within an hour the plan in my head. I've got the plan in my head within an hour. Now, I often stay. I want to stay. If there's anything the client wants to show me, I want to see it. If there's any question they've got, I want to answer it before I leave. But I, I typically know, not always, but typically I know within the first hour what I'm going to do with that property. And I, I forgot what I was going to say, the second point. But, uh, you know, you don't have to stay there all day. and You don't have to see every tree. Uh, I think a lot of guys think that we're going to micromanage every square foot of the property, and that's not the case. You know, we're going to look at it from a, a 30,000 foot view. Uh, we're going to figure where we're going to bed the deer, create the sanctuary, where we're going to put the food, and how we're going to kill the deer. It, how it's laid out is, is the, the secret sauce, if you will. It's, I mean, everybody knows you create a sanctuary and you get the deer bedded on your property. There's some tricks about how to go about that to get the best results and i, I know you, you cut down on human intrusion and things but you know there's things you can plant and, and such but how it's laid out is the critical thing you, you don't just go put a, a food plot someplace just because it's uh where there's always been a food plot there's been more than once we i've been on a property and, and i've said let's forget this food plot this is going to become cover I, I don't care what you you can plant switchgrass here you can plant trees here conifers whatever this is not the place for the food plot how are you gonna how are you gonna get in here and hunt it? Uh, it? It's just not to your advantage to have it here. So, how it's laid out is the critical piece. 
You know, I don't, I don't think that we, how do I say this? That doesn't make it sound like I'm trying to claim arrogance or I mean, this is with the most humility as I possibly can. There's a very, very large number of people that listen to us every week. And I think that they think they know us personally because they're, we talk about our families, we talk about our lives and the awkward part isn't when we get in front of a person at a farm or a bad experience. I, I agree with you a hundred percent. The awkward part for me is that when we go to a trade show or we go and someone comes up and just has a conversation with us, it's like they know all about us, but we don't know them. And that really makes me feel awkward because, you know, I don't feel like I can carry that conversation the same way that they expect it. But mm-hmm. it's, um, yeah, I've talked to other people that have, you know, very popular YouTube channels and they, they say the same thing. I guess, you know, the only negative that I have experienced out of any of it is people showing up at my house. I'm not, I hate to say it, but I'm really uncomfortable with that. We're actually very private people and I'm in a geographic area that gets a lot of tourist traffic because of the art and it is a weekly occurrence of people that want to, and and they mean so good by it. I've never had, you know, and somebody try to be mean or do anything, but it's very difficult for my family. You know, I'm not here a lot and people just rock up to my house and want to say hello or meet me. And man, that's just weird. I'm not that that's the only negative if I can pick out anything. And now I know why some of famous people don't have their homes listed in their names and don't have their contact information out there like we do. Yeah. You know, we just sold the uh some product from real world to a a famous athlete and i recognized the name and i thought is this really who i think it is and so i got (laughs) online and did research and and it was him same town he lives in the same town and everything but he didn't have it shipped to his address he had it shipped to a p.o box yep and uh, i know why and and also his name is bill but he used william instead of bill (laughs) as the first name on his order but his last name was unique enough that, that I understood. And, you know, Terry, I, I know exactly what you mean about people showing up. I had a, a young Amish couple show up here in the last week or so, and uh, I, I didn't know they was coming or anything. I, I was on a uh, conference Zoom call on the computer, and somebody's ringing my doorbell, you know, and and I didn't know who it was. So I excused myself from this meeting and, and went outside to see what was going on. And, Oh, and it was no. this young Amish couple, and, and I apologized to him. I, I I hope he's listening because he said, you know, I listen to you every week, and I had to had to meet the guy I listen to every week. But uh, I was in the middle of that conference call, and I had to I, I spent about three minutes out there and, and ran back in the house and got back on that that Zoom call. But uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's one thing when you're out in public and someone comes and thanks you. Yeah. I mean. Just this week, I had a young man. I was driving out of my driveway, and they were there was this big ag chemical place was spraying the field right next to to my lane on the neighbor's side, and uh, they were filling up the sprayer right there at the end of my lane. And I pulled down to the end of the lane. I had some stuff to shove into the mailbox, so I parked my truck. I walked across the road, and as I'm walking back, this young man was coming across the field to meet me, and he's a listener of the podcast, and. Uh, he just thanked you and me both for our sharing our Christian faith and everything. And, uh, you know, I love hearing that kind of stuff. I went, I was, I was leaving. I turned around, I went back to the house and I got him a chasing giants hat and took it back to him. But, uh, yeah, when people start knocking on your door unannounced, that's, that's totally different. But I remember <laughs> what I was going to say before about the consulting is that when I go on a consulting visit, you know, I, I said it takes me about an hour. I know what I'm going to do. Right. I, I typically know within 30 minutes if this client is going to get it. And absolutely. To, to, to yep. be brutally honest, there is a, a small percentage of clients that are never going to get it. They're never going to understand. They're, they're never going to get the picture in their head that you're trying to convey. And, and I'll tell you what, usually my struggle on a property is that first hour I'm touring the property, but I'm also. I'm listening. I do a lot more listening that first hour than talking, and I'm listening to the client, and I'm trying to get a feel for his personality and his knowledge of, of his property and deer hunting and 
there's a lot of times I am uh, very impressed by the, the amount of knowledge and the effort that these yep. guys have put into it. And, you know, when, when I'm doing that initial tour, I tell the guys, I said, you're going to think that I don't talk on this first tour. We're, you just give me the grand tour and then we will reverse course. And on the reverse course, I'm going to be the one talking. And so yep. I'm taking it all in and you, you can, you can know within 30 minutes if this guy is going to get it or, and what I'm doing during that hour or so, that initial tour, is I'm trying, and my mind is spinning, how am I going to convey the message that I, I have in my head? I've got to convey this to this guy so that he gets it. And, and that is the challenge for me, is getting them to see their property the way I see it. Right. And sometimes it's, it's, all, it's almost impossible. And I mean, I've come up with some pretty unique ways of, and using analogies to say, okay, think of yep. it like this, and then I'll, I'll I'll use some analogy. But that's probably the biggest challenge for me. And it doesn't happen on every client. Actually, it's a small percentage of clients. I think the biggest majority, um, they are very knowledgeable um, about land management for whitetails. They are just like an open or a sponge. They're just absorbing everything you throw out there. But occasionally, you get one of those those guys that. Uh, you just can't find the words to make him understand and even follow up phone calls and emails. You're, you're, you're continually trying to get this guy to see what you see the potential in his property. Right. All right. Great question. Thanks for submitting it. We'll move on to a question from Kyle. We may not get through six tonight, Terry, but yeah, we'll try. Get what we get. Yeah. This one comes from Kyle Tepe. I hope I said your name right. From Oakland City, Indiana, it says, uh, "Hey Don and Terry, I submitted a question a while back asking what to plant in yard to satisfy <laughs> wife and deer, and Don got a kick out of it. And I planted a blend of tall fescue and white clover, and it looks great. But my question now is, I have long open driveway, and wife wants trees that will canopy over someday. Is there a faster growing oak tree that would be a good choice to plant in this scenario? Going for it." Two birds with one stone approach again. Thanks and continuing prayers for both of your families. Kyle, without a doubt, the oak tree that I would suggest is the swamp white oak. You know, I had the tree nursery for almost 20 years, and we planted a lot of oaks in the nursery that we would, you know, dig up in burlap when they got two to three inch caliper. And the swamp white oaks were always the first to produce acorns. The, there was a lot of trees that were producing acorns by the time they were two inch caliper. You know, we're talking uh, ten foot or so tall. So you can get some food for your deer in a hurry with swamp white oaks, and they love the acorns, by the way. But a swamp white oak, really, there's not that much growth difference in one species of oaks versus another. People think that uh, white oaks are, are really slow growing. And they're not that much slower than other oaks. So right here in my new yard, before we built a house, I knew there was going to be a house here one day. And several years ago, I planted five different oak trees in a row um, right out here in front of my house. And you probably know the ones I'm talking about, Terry. So I've got a white oak. I've got a chinkapin oak. I've got a red oak, a swamp white oak, and a bur oak. Five species of oaks right in a row. When I planted them, um, years ago, they was all the same size. They were uh, they were grown in root maker bags. Uh, they had probably about an inch and a half caliper. Same size when I planted them. And we're talking at least ten years ago that I planted these trees. Today, every one of them trees looks the same size. You can look right down that row, and it's a row of oaks. Every oak's a different species, but they're all the same size. If I was you, I would plant swamp white oaks up and down your your drive. They'll produce acorns quick, and they will grow as fast as any other oak out there. One of the things that I do not like about pin oaks close to a driveway is the way the limbs hang off of the trunk of that tree. They're up really high, and then they go down. Yeah. There's two of these things in my front yard, and that these, tr these pin oaks are huge. They're probably 30 to 36 inches in diameter, and out. Way away from the trunk, I got a mow underneath of these things that are now three feet off the ground. But when you go back to the tree, I can't even touch them with my pole saw. 
Right. So I'm gonna have to get up in that in the in there with a the loader or something to get up high enough to trim the the limbs back that are almost on the ground out by it. So I would not put a pin oak next to your driveway. No, pin oak has a very unique branch structure. The branches come straight out and downward rather than going up. They may there is a good use for a pin oak though. It is a great scrape tree because those branches go downward yep. towards the ground and they hold their leaves in the winter. A pin Definitely. oak is a great tree uh, to plant, like uh, for a scrape tree. We did a video on that on the Whitetail Master Academy here a while back. Um, in front of some of my blinds, I planted some burlap trees, like just one tree in the food plot, you know, for the deer to scrape under. And I used pin oaks for that. Yeah. You just don't want to drive your car under them. Nope. All right. Well, let's do one more question, and then we'll uh, we'll talk about our new sponsor. This one comes from Michael Rayburn from Lafayette, Louisiana. He says, hey, guys, I can't get enough of the stuff you all put out. It has really helped me become a better deer hunter and land manager. manager. Before finding Chasing Giants and listening to your advice, I always relied more on luck for any success I would occasionally have. Today, luck is still part of the equation, but a much smaller part than it once was. Can you talk about the impact that luck plays? Do you think luck is ever 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 totally eliminated from factoring into deer hunter success well no i don't I, michael i think that there's always a degree of luck I, I don't i don't care what property you're hunting or what your hunting skill or, or anything about it you, you can know the, the exact whereabouts of a buck because of trail camera pictures you can have sole access to the property but there's there's just luck involved in having property I prefer to, to call it a blessing, but some people call it luck. Luck is always going to be a factor to some degree. But the thing of it is, what we want to do is a, is minimize luck as much as possible in every aspect. So, you know, a, a good thing, if I was going to have a conversation with any deer hunter in the country to help them improve their success, I would ask a question to start with. What is limiting your success today? And there's going to be guys from some states, they're going to say, well, it's the state I live in. You know, I live in Pennsylvania or I live in Michigan and we don't have the big bucks that I want to kill. Well, okay. If you stay in Michigan or Pennsylvania, luck, if for you to kill a giant buck, luck is going to be a much bigger factor. You need to do what you can to address that. Now, whether that means moving to another state or saving all your vacation time and going to another state for the best part of the hunting season, I don't know, but you need to look at what is limiting your success. The number one thing limiting your success today, and that needs to be the thing that you address the most. Luck is always going to be part of it. I was lucky or blessed to be born in an area that has big deer. Um, no doubt about it. I don't know what it's like to be born in a state like Pennsylvania or Michigan and and want to kill big deer, but they're just not around. I, I would think, I, I don't know for certain because, you know, I'm close to family and such. I, I would think that I would have picked up roots when I was younger and I would have moved out of state, but that's not easy for me to say, or it is easy for me to say because I've never had to live it. Yep. You guys that do have to live it, <laughs> you know, I feel for you because I never had to make that choice. But whatever it is that's limiting your success the more you can address that, the less luck is going to play into your success. Absolutely. All right. Well, thanks for the question. Let's take a, a break from the questions right now. And I want to talk about a, a very good friend of ours that you actually met through consulting. Uh, we announced um, around the end of the year, or beginning of the year, that uh, Buy Farm, um, due to their business levels, and what they wanted to do with the company, it just wasn't working out that they could get us farms every week to to showcase on here. So, but why don't you talk a little bit about our good friend Brian Craft and what's going on with a company called Midwest Land Group? And then I talked to Brian this week. I got a couple of comments he wanted me to share with everybody. Yeah, first of all, I want to thank Biofarm. They helped us get this podcast off the ground. Great guys at Biofarm. There's absolutely no hard feelings either way with us or Biofarm on the relationship that we had, they decided to, to go uh, spend their um, advertising dollars a different way, and, and we was fine with it. You guys, a lot of you know that I had my um, real estate license 
for a number of years. I allowed that license to expire at the end of April, so I am no longer a licensed real estate agent. But uh, I've been friends with Brian Kraft for several years now. I I did I met him through my consulting business. Uh, he started Midwest Land Group uh, several years ago, and, and they operate a little bit different than any other real estate group that I've ever been to. And you know, the thing that really impressed me about Brian, and I've been back to his place, various farms for him, I think at least three times. I looked at at least three properties for him. But whenever I would go to, to consult on one of Brian's properties, the day would always start with us sitting down in his cabin and talking for one or two hours before we ever went out the door. And he was always, you know, he knew I had my real estate license and he was always trying to help me, you know, be successful at that. And I never pursued it. I just didn't have time like I should have. But he is very, very data driven. You guys have probably heard me say that, uh, mention the fact that real estate over the past 40 years has appreciated on average 7% a year. I got that figure from Brian. He did the research. A, A lot of what I've learned about real estate came from Brian. Again, totally different. I think they're looking to expand. Right now, they're out in Kansas. um, Missouri, Oklahoma. In Nebraska, maybe. Yep. Yep. Uh, They're they're looking to expand east. So, I mean, just a fantastic Christian man who runs his company with integrity, and he treats his agents just fantastic. I know there's some... he, He had previously worked for another big real estate company that was limiting the amount that their top agents could make. And yeah. he doesn't do that. He, he treats his agents. He wants his agents to be uber successful. And because if they are, he is. And j- just a great guy. And I'm proud to be associated with uh, the Midwest Land Group. Well, I want to be transparent with everybody on what the benefit of Chasing Giants gets out of this and what Midwest, Midwest Land Group so unlike the relationship we have with Biofarm, Biofarm used us to showcase properties. Brian is not going to do that. Brian's company is expanding into new markets that we have a lot of listeners in. And his biggest goal is to connect through Chasing Giants to potential agents, especially in Indiana. There's going to be a day for Ohio. There's going to be a day for you know all of the states moving east. And he wants to connect because of the quality of people that he knows are in the Chasing Giants family. So the low-hanging fruit for him is that connection to find new agents. They are very, very specific with the type of people that work for them and know that to really be successful selling agriculture and recreational properties, it takes a a different type of real estate agent. So uh, that's what he's trying to get out of it. What we wanted to do out of this is provide more ideas for navigating real estate. And that is, uh, you know, people from out of state looking for hunting properties to invest in. What do they need to look for? What's financing options? What's land trade options versus just going out and buy it, you know, just doing the title swaps. We want to offer that as a a kind of extra tool for everybody. So what Brian has agreed to do, I actually asked him if he wanted to come on this podcast tonight to just introduce himself. And uh, he said, no, that's okay. What he would rather everybody do is pull up some real estate questions for buying recreational properties or agriculture properties, and then he would come on and try to answer some of those for us. So his request to all of our listeners, if you got real estate questions, submit them through the normal channels, and we'll kind of put those in a queue and then have Brian coming on. But for those of you who've been around the podcast a long time, you may kind of remember the name Brian Craft or Midwest Land Group for one big thing. And if you don't remember, Brian and Midwest Land Group actually were the other side of the donation of the truck that Chris Yates donated for Lester's Feet for the raffle a year and a half ago. So when Lester's Feet had that big raffle and we auctioned off that truck, that was Chris Yates and Brian Craft that donated that truck. So he has been a supporter and friend of Chasing Giants for such a long time, but he is one of the most giving people that you'll ever meet. Him and Chris Yates are two of a kind. They're actually really good friends. I think they even own adjoining properties, but uh, he has been a huge supporter of Lester's Feet. So we are absolutely humbled. We're excited. You know, 
just to just to have someone of his caliber in our court as a friend, as a as a business person. He he called me when we lost our jobs and encouraged me because it happened to him years ago. Um, having people like that in your corner and associated with it means the world to us. So we're really really excited to have him on. You know, in my conversations with Brian, I've learned some things about him personally, you know, but also how he operates his business. And it's not my place to, to share any of that. If he wants to, he can. But, guys, I want to tell you something. Midwest Land Group is a different kind of company to work with. He's not going to just take any agent that comes and throws a application his way or, or a resume. But if you can get hooked up, if, if you're in the real estate business and you can get hooked up with Midwest Land Group, you're, you're going to find that, that Brian Kraft is a, an absolute first-class individual, high integrity that cares about the people he deals with. I, I mean, both the people that work for him and, and just friends like Terry and I, you're just a great guy. He uh, called me and we talked for almost an hour and a half the other day. And all it was was just encouraging my wife and I. It didn't have anything to do with business. So that's the type of guy that I appreciate. But I want to tell you something. The, the guy kills some giant deer too. He is oh, yeah. he is a really good deer hunter. And we're going to be able to share some deer hunting stories with him in the future. So welcome aboard, aboard Midwest West Land Group. We appreciate it. We're very selective of the people we work with. He asked about this many, many years ago, and we told him until Biofarm decides they want to go a different direction, we're not going to have another real estate company, and we wanted to be loyal to that. But when the opportunity arose, he quickly uh, he quickly started asking about it. So we are very excited and appreciate Brian's support, and uh, we'll have him on the show soon. So submit your questions about, not, not in the comments below, but submit them on the uh, higginsoutdoors.com or chasinggiants.com website and we'll pull them together and get those answered uh, as a resource to you guys if you're looking for uh, to sell real estate couldn't ask for a better company to be associated with get your resume over to those guys so let's uh, get to the next question here uh, next one comes from Roger Draper from Pleasant Shade Tennessee uh, says, Don and Terry, thanks for all the information you fellows give out on the podcast. I le live down here with Bobby Worthington, but I hunt up there west of Don's location. And my question is that I have two full weeks to hunt this year up there and was wondering which two weeks, last week of October and first week of November or first two weeks of November. Thanks again for all y'all do and may God bless. Roger. That is a great question, and I'll tell you, it's one that I'm starting to shift my opinion on a little bit. I've always said that uh, the seven-day period from November 5th through the 12th is a great period for, for shooting a buck. That's the period where you're going to see the most bucks. But everything is, is really weather-driven as far as the rut. That end of October period, I think, is... I, I'm I'm starting to pay way more attention to it than I did in the past. And if I'm you not get a talking, cold front, especially that you got to have the weather. That's the thing, and that's why this question is so difficult to to answer. Is because I don't know what the weather is going to be that last week of October. If you've got cold weather the last week of October, it can be better than the than November. But you've got to have that cold weather. Otherwise, it's it's no different than the middle of October. So. My suggestion to you was that if you have a job where you can, you know, take, use your vacation on a whim and you don't have to schedule it weeks or months in advance, when you start getting into mid-October, you know, I'd talk to your boss and I'd say, hey, I got two weeks of vacation coming. I'll let you know as soon as possible when I'm going to take it. And then I'd just start watching the weather. And if you see that last week of October, it's going to, you know, have some cooler than normal temperatures in the region where you're going to be hunting, then I would I would get here as quick as you can right ahead of that cold front and hunt right through it. But, uh, you, you know, that last week of October, actually from about the 20th of October on, I've killed a lot of bucks in that period. And uh, I think that's a time where those bucks aren't ranging too far. They're, they're moving more in daylight, given the, the right weather and temperatures. But they're not ranging too far, and if you're if you're close to them, then there is a much better chance of you catching them on their feet then than there is two weeks later when you get to 10th, 12th of November, and those bucks are covering miles at that time. 
they're just a whole lot harder to pin down. So don't discount that last week of October. And that's a mistake that I've made for a lot of years. Yep. Great question. You know, for the guys that have to schedule it and, and ride the week out regardless, it's tough. Absolutely yep. tough. You and I have both been known to drive three or four hours for one set and drive back home. Um, right. we've, we've both done that before when we find the conditions are right. Yeah, you're just going to have to play it based on your job. You may, you may be better off scheduling the, the last week of October and the first week of November. Then if you see that last week of October is going to be warm, just ask your boss if you could postpone your vacation for a week and, and uh, you know, shift that week you know back. And that, yeah. that'd be the probably the uh, method I would try to use with your employer. Well, we're going to run a little long on this podcast, and I hope that's all right. But I want to end with this question. We're not going to get through six, but I'm going to make Don end on a sentimental note uh, with this question because, uh, I don't know, I just don't want to listen to it another week. I want to hear your answer to it now. Hmm. Uh, this one comes from John Scott from Jacksonville, Oklahoma. It says, I recently found the Chasing Giants podcast and your YouTube channel, and really appreciate your approach to deer hunting and life in general. Don, your babe video was amazing, and my prayers are with your daughter as she battles cancer. The whole legacy theme of the video caused me to really reflect on what my own legacy will be one day after I am gone. You are obviously leaving a legacy for your grandsons and beyond, but you ever have you ever thought about the legacy that you will one day leave for the hunting community to remember you? How do you want to be remembered by those in the hunting community? I know that you have some haters, but even they have benefited from the knowledge that you have shared and will remember you whether they want to admit it or not. Thanks for selecting my question. Wow. Well, John, how do I want to be remembered in the hunting industry? You know, probably the the number one thing is I want to be remembered as a guy that used my platform to, to... spread my faith share my faith i've had a lot of guys like the young man i told you about running the sprayer uh, on the field next to my place this week i've had a lot of young guys come up and tell me they appreciated that that uh, listening to terry and i have have really caused them to step back and take a look at their own life and, and, and evaluate how they're raising their families you know people would probably think that i want to be remembered for shooting big deer and that's really way down the list. I want to be remembered for using my platform to share my faith and encouraging others. I want to be remembered as a guy that spoke the truth, no matter what it cost me. I promise you that me opening my mouth has cost me more dollars than it's made me. And that's fine. I'm I'm not starving today. I've made my share. I've shot my share of big, big deer. And if I never shoot another big deer, I never make another dollar. I've done... I, I've got more than my share of both. I, I don't want to be remembered as one of those guys that uh, hop from sponsor to sponsor. I was there for the highest bidder. I had a, a company or a person's integrity or, or character never played into it for me. I was there for just a dollar to make a dollar. That's not me at all. And I know I get accused of that some by the haters. You know, that's their problem. They're going to have to live with it. Anybody that knows me knows that my mouth has cost me more money than it's ever made me. <laughs> you know, it, it'll be what it'll be. So I'd say those two things would, would be at the top of the list. How I've used my platform to spread my faith and the fact that I stood on my principles no matter how much money it cost me. That's awesome. Well, let's end the show and transition because it's a very similar send your dialogue to end the show. This is Memorial Day weekend and um, how important that is to you and... Uh, let's just close out with some reflection about that a little bit. Well, you know, I, I, I say and I think to myself all the time that I am I am the epitome of the American dream. I'm the guy that started with nothing. You know, I didn't come here from a foreign country like some people did, but I started with nothing, folks. I mean, literally nothing. And I've chased my dream, and eventually, you know, I made it. And I'm not filthy rich, but I'm doing pretty good. And it it could have never happened in any other country than this one. And, and the only reason this country is so great is because of all those folks over the years who have gave their lives for you and I. You know, I've got it easy. I, you know, the haters on the internet, whatever. 
putting up with that is nothing compared to the sacrifices that people make every single day. You know, our, our first responders, um, you know, th this country has become a mess where we, we don't even support our law enforcement. But it, it's really the soldiers who gave their lives that we're re remembering this weekend. Just so crazy people like me can chase a, a ridiculous dream like making a living from deer hunting. It could have never happened in any other country in the world ever. But it happened here, and it's all because of the soldiers. We don't owe the politicians anything. We owe it all to these soldiers and the ones that gave the ultimate sacrifice. I just hope that all the listeners will remember not only them but their families. You know, there's, their families, a lot of them are sacrificing right now. They, they've lost a loved one in some military battle in, in recent years, a son, a brother, a husband, whatever, daughter. There's people suffering today so that folks like me can, can have a good life in the, the best country this planet's ever known. And I think most people know, that know me at all know that how patriotic I am. And, and guys, I'm telling you, this country, I can't stand my government today. It, it's become an absolute evil dictatorship. But I absolutely love this country. And uh, I would sacrifice so much just if my grandsons could grow up in the same country that I grew up in decades ago. I hope we can get back to that. I have my doubts, but it's all in God's hands, really. But I really want to truly, from the bottom of my heart, I want to thank every soldier that ever laid down his life and every family that sacrificed, because they're still sacrificing today. Losing a, a family member, a loved one, is something that you'll never get over. From the bottom of my heart, I thank those folks. Talking about deer hunting and arguing about different ways to kill a big buck means peanuts compared to uh, what this weekend is about. So as we wrap up the show, just thank you all that are serving or have served or have sacrificed from the bottom of our hearts. It means a lot. God bless everyone. God bless America. Hope you guys have a great week. Take care. Chasing Giants has been brought to you by Osseo Camo, by a farm real estate company, 360 Hunting Blinds, Victory Chevrolet, Real World Wildlife Products, Matthews Archery, Novix Tree Stands, Gingerich Tree Farm, WildlifeFarming.com, Quiet Cat, and Vortex Optics. Thanks for listening, and tune in next week for another episode of Chasing Giants.